Hi, my name is Amanda Piquet. I'm an Associate Professor of Neurology and Director of the Autoimmune Neurology Program at the University of Colorado. Thanks for tuning in for this edition on the Neuroimmunology Nuggets. Today, we're going to discuss the person syndrome. We're going to try to demystify this rare neurologic disease. We'll discuss the diagnostic workup, the underlying proposed pathophysiology of this disease, as well as treatment approaches. What is stiff person syndrome? Well, stiff person syndrome, or SPS, is a rare chronic autoimmune neurologic disorder that causes central nervous system hyperexcitability, and this leads to symptoms of episodic muscle spasms and stiffness, often triggered by noise, touch, or emotional stress. This disorder is rare. It's thought to affect about one in a million, although large-scale epidemiology studies are lacking, and misdiagnosis is common, making an accurate estimate on prevalence and insulin incidence difficult. Stiff person syndrome disorder is variable in terms of ways patients can present. There are different clinical phenotypes. Just to be clear, a single patient does not typically move across phenotypes, except for maybe seeing stiff limb syndrome evolve into more classic symptoms. But it's highly unlikely that a patient with confirmed classic stiff person syndrome will develop a pure cerebellar phenotype, or PERM, also known as progressive encephalomyelitis with rigidity and myoclonus. Classic stiff person syndrome often involves the trunk and the torso with legs greater than arm involvement. PERM is a severe form of stiff person syndrome spectrum disorder and causes widespread severe muscle rigidity and myoclonus. Myoclonus is an abnormal involuntary jerking type movement. Patients can have signs of cerebellar ataxia such as dizziness, balance issues, and coordination issues. When that occurs as part of SPS, it can be described sometimes as SPS plus phenotype, or some patients just have a syndrome where it's pure cerebellar ataxia, and that actually occurs as a separate autoimmune phenotype or disease in the setting of GAD65 antibodies. And we're going to get into those antibodies in a little bit more detail. The diagnosis is a challenge and misdiagnosis is common. Diagnosis is based on clinical presentation, electrophysiologic evidence with an EMG, and antibody testing. The most common antibody test that we see positive in SPS is GAD65, but there are other associated antibodies as well, with the second most common one being glycine receptor antibody. And we're going to talk about this in a bit on some more slides. There is a small subset of patients that do not have a positive antibody, and these are usually referred to seronegative cases. And this makes the diagnosis even more challenging. EMG can be very helpful in this context. And there are certain signs that we can see on EMG that are characteristic of stiff person syndrome. Additional testing may include a lumbar puncture to evaluate for spinal fluid or CSF antibodies. Diagnosis also, or diagnostic workup also includes imaging such as spinal cord or brain MRI. Occasionally, even genetic testing is considered to actually look for other mimics of SPS, including neurodegenerative disease or genetic mimics. SPS causes central nervous system hyperexcitability, again, leading to these symptoms of muscle spasms and stiffness. This can be triggered by noise, touch, emotional stress, or sometimes in severe cases just spontaneously. With nervous system hyperexcitability, there is a problem with putting the brakes on the nervous system. This figure here on this slide from Dr. Delacus with the paper um, cited below illustrates this dysfunction with the impaired GABAergic signal. And this is the, with this impaired GABAergic signal, these GABA neurons in the spinal cord are not working properly. And so the GABA receptor becomes dysfunctional and 
the inhibitory signal in the brain and spinal cord is not working. And when you don't have that inhibition, you basically have those brakes unchecked. And so when the brakes don't work, the, the brain will continue to send signals down the spinal cord, allowing for this continuous firing at the level of the muscle, leading to these uncontrolled muscle contractions, which can be quite painful. While a clear underlying pathophysiology it remains largely unknown in SPS, it is hypothesized that this is related to this GABA receptor, as I demonstrated on the previous slide. Now, if you kind of hone in and look closer at this GABA receptor shown on this slide, there are different antibody binding sites that can be uh, recognized, and um, this is what's thought to cause the dysfunction. So glutamic acid decarboxylase, or GAD, serves as the rate-limiting enzyme that makes GABA from glutamate. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that is critical to the release of, or is critical uh, to be released to put on those brakes in this neurotransmitter. So GAD65 antibodies are the most commonly seen antibody in stiff person syndrome. There are other antibodies that have been recognized in this disease. And those antibodies actually have protein or antigen targets in this GABA receptor as well. So you could see this on this slide. Uh, labeled one is that GAD65, again, the most common. Number two is amphipycin. Number three is GABA-A receptor, although this one, this antibody is extremely uncommon. Number four is glycine receptor. And this is the most, uh, this is the second most common antibody after GAD65 that we generally see. And Jefferin is another rare antibody uh, identified as five. DPPX identified as six has also been described in SPS. But this one's also quite rare and often causes other syndromes outside of that classic SPS phenotype. The most comprehensive commercial testing to date at this time, at least when this was recorded in June of 2023, is available at the Mayo Clinic. There is a separate stiff person syndrome evaluation or panel of antibodies that includes uh, several antibodies for testing that I described on the previous slide. And this can be seen on uh, this uh, slide here in that blue circle. If patients present with more ataxia or a movement disorder as part of their presentation, it might be more appropriate to order uh, broader antibody testing. Um, and you could see this with the movement disorder evaluation, which has a lot of different other antibodies seen in the testing. And that's in that uh, uh, white circle here. Importantly, GAD65 is included in both panels. Um, equally as important, glycine is not, or at least as of yet. And this needs to be considered because if you have a patient with stiff person syndrome, you want to make sure that you're getting that glycine antibody tested. Um, if patients have stiffness and spasms and that startle reflex that I talked about, it's important not to forget this antibody if the movement disorder evaluation is ordered. So when looking at a positive GAD65 antibody, titers matter. GAD65 is a tricky antibody test. It can be seen as low positive values in other autoimmune conditions, especially type 1 diabetes, but also other common systemic autoimmune disorders like autoimmune thyroid disease. It is also commonly detected at low levels in 8% of the general population. Therefore, we can see false positives at these low levels, and we can see false positives in patients receiving things like IVIG, which are which has donor antibodies from from thousands of others of um, uh, donors. <laughs> 
High titers are typically seen with neurologic disease, and the definition of what is considered to be a high titer can vary depending on the testing methods used. And some examples of those high titer cutoffs are given on this slide. So outside of the antibody testing in the blood, the diagnostic workup often includes that EMG, MRIs, and a lumbar puncture. The treatment approach for stiff person syndrome is multifactorial and aimed at symptomatic therapy as well as immune therapy. Many medications are aimed at improving symptoms by improving that GABA receptor and that neurotransmission, meaning putting those brakes back on. This includes benzodiazepines, and often Valium is used. This includes anti-spasticity agents such as baclofen, as well as medications used um, for seizures and chronic pain, such as gabapentin. Supportive therapies are also very important, and that includes physical therapy, hydrotherapy, and psychological support. Stiff person syndrome patients can experience severe anxiety due to phobias of falling, um, or completing kind of simple physical tasks. And oftentimes psychological support, both at home or potentially at work, um, is extremely helpful with dealing with these phobias. Phobias can lead to depression, and that just highlights even more this need for multifactorial care from the beginning. Immune therapies are often utilized in stiff person syndrome, given the concern that this is driven by an underlying autoimmune disease. It's important to recognize there are no FDA-approved therapies for stiff person syndrome, but there are several immune therapies often used that are used in other autoimmune neurologic conditions. IVIG appears to have the most benefit. This is based on limited studies to date, but it's often used as first-line therapy. Rituximab is often used as second-line therapy, although data, again, is limited. There was one small trial which failed to prove its benefit, but it was a small trial, and it's important to look at what the outcome measures are to define its benefit. Other therapies may include plasma exchange, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, or mycophenolate, also known as Celsept. Third-line therapies may include autologous hematopoic stem cell transplant, but this is typically done on a research basis. This is one of the landmark studies using IVIG in stiff person syndrome. This early publication showed that IVIG is well-tolerated and effective for patients with stiff person syndrome. Additional studies since the time have continued to support the effectiveness of IVIG um, in stiff person syndrome. However, when following patients a long time, over time there does appear to be this diminished benefit of IVIG as the disease progresses. And it's just important that more research is done in stiff person syndrome to identify better effective therapies. And with that, I would like to thank you for tuning in to this edition on stiff person syndrome spectrum disorder for neuroimmunology nuggets.